things or under contracts, anything like that. Well, I just want to celebrate that you're that you're all here, and it's a Wednesday morning, and this is a great place to be. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to move on to our broker moment. What do you need to do before closing if you are working with a tenant occupied property? Here's a couple things here, but I want to hear from you. So hop on, tell me what you, uh, other things that you would need to do if you were working with a tenant occupied property. Brandon, I know you have some answers on this. Well, for one, um, your seller's disclosures that time period during seller's disclosures, not the actual property disclosure document, they must include rent rolls, leases, ledgers, all sorts of things like that. Um, I think oftentimes agents forget that and then they get to closing and um, don't have any of that information. So that must be included. Also, if you're representing the buyer or the seller, title needs to be notified about, you know, the fact that there's some tenants in, in this property and that the rents and deposits deposits need to be prorated to be ready for dispersing. We had an agent that went to closing the other day and was di didn't have any direction on where those things were. And I, the title company had never heard about the fact that there's tenants in this property. So <clears throat> if you if if you have a property that has tenants in it, we got to remember to let the title company know. Now what if you can think of anything else? I want you to tell me now. But also, what about just like a lease back? What are your thoughts on having just a lease back? Like that's really prominent right now in our market where a buyer offers on a property and there's the seller wants to stay in the property. What are some of the things that you need to address? Again, I put them all there for you, but anyone think of anything that came up? Um, payment for utility services. Who's going to be responsible for that up until what point? Um, um, and, and it's pretty much between the seller and the buyer. It's not any, any, I mean, you would use the, uh, the form that's for that, but um, working with, with those considerations, I guess. Yeah, awesome, Wendell, thank you. That's so true. Um, I think in this market, the buyers are very willing to do just about anything. Sure, you could stay in the property, right? But then when it gets to closing, well, who's paying for utilities? Because the buyer now owns the property and the sellers are just living there. So it needs to be addressed in your contract. Don't forget that. So Wendell, thank you for that example. That's a great idea. Um, did I miss a chat? Let's see. Somebody say anything? Oh, Brandon's just mic is not working. Okay. Um, and then what about a deposit if the seller's just staying in the property? Has anyone thought about that? That's something that, um, you know, what happens is, for instance, I just closed on a property and the seller wanted 60 days to stay in the property. Well, um, we held back, it was only a condo, like a thousand square foot condo, but we held back a thousand dollars in case of anything changing from our final walkthrough to when we moved in. So sure enough, when we moved in, the refrigerator was frozen over and they had the doors open, de-thawing it out and the air conditioner didn't work. Well, the seller came back and said, I need my thousand dollars. And we were like, are you kidding me? With our final walkthrough, the fridge worked and so did the AC. So we don't even know how much money it's going to cost. So I would highly, highly suggest you think about the worst case scenario, damages, anything, if you're allowing the seller to stay in the property and put something like that at title that says, a, uh, you know, an amount of money to be held back in case anything changes from our final walkthrough to when we actually move in. So these are some things that a lot of people right now in this market are forgetting. And so we wanted to remind you of those. Anybody have any thoughts or questions or comments? I do, Jen. If the, if the, um, seller is staying in the property longer than a certain time period. Are there um, things that we need to, to consider relating to uh, taxes or that they become, and, and um, I, I guess a, a resident, I get one of the things on the, in the hotel industry, if, you, if a guest stayed longer than, I think it was 30 days or so, then according to state laws, and, and that would vary, but, they become an, a uh, resident and then they're subject to, or I mean, their, their uh, taxes are waived on their, their part. Um, are there things that we need to consider like that if they stay too long and um, things that could happen? 
I love that you're thinking like that, Wendell. And it looks like, uh, was it Brandon that said that? The last comment? That I can is chime a... in on that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so in the state of Utah, it's actually 21 days. They become, um, they get tenancy uh, rights after 21 days. Uh, so in the case of that, and I am dealing with that right now, is when you're, when all of a sudden your buyer transitions into being a landlord for a period of time. Do not use the lease back agreement that the MLS provides. If you're doing anything long-term like that, you're going to want to have them be actual tenants. Um, and then, you know, they deal with their taxes with their CPA in that respect. But you do want to use a proper lease. You want to collect a deposit from them. Perhaps they're going to balk at being a, getting a credit and background check, but you should require them to provide you with things like social security numbers because I've got, I'm facing one right now where they're actually going to do a lease back for a year. Well, after a year, we need to be able to ensure that they're performing as tenants. Now they're no longer owner and buyer, they're tenant and landlords. So we have to make sure they're performing as tenants and that we have security deposits to protect that landlord and define anything like inspections because that, that new tenant who has been the owner is still going to feel like the owner and may resist being treated like a tenant. So all of those things need to be discussed right before you get to settlement, because if you get to settlement and start presenting documents to that uh, seller, they may resist. So make sure you speak about that, discuss that with that listing agent right from the get-go. How lucky are we to have our property manager on during this broker moment? This is what ins she inspired this last night in our, in our broker meeting. I was like, oh, good. I needed a broker moment. So thank you so much, Ludi. That's such great advice. And while we have our insurance um, agent on, on our call as well, it's another thing that comes up. When you close on a property, that if the seller closes on a property that they own, during that life of that loan, they probably had insurance. I bet the day they close, they no longer had insurance. So who has the insurance then? And so the buyer has to have insurance when they close, but then who's, who's responsible if the buyer, if the seller is staying in the property and the house burns down, right? And so you may want to talk to your insurance agent as well as, by the way, we have a tenant in this property for however long it is. Ludi said she has one that's a year, whether it's a month or 60 days and uh, make sure that your insurance company knows that they, you know, or their insurance company is covering it, whatever it is. So that's a, another thing to bring up. So Great, great points here. I'm so glad yeah, all of sure they get uh, you, that your buyer gets a landlord policy and that that uh, owner that's now turned into a tenant gets a renter's insurance. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're all thinking like this. And it looks like Brandon brought up the point about sometimes loans are affected if they stay in the property longer than 60 days. Um, and so you will need to make sure your lender is aware that um, the buyer will be staying in the property if you are getting a loan on that home. So again, all these little details that we need to know as realtors if we have a property with a tenant in it. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Ludi. Ludi probably would be better, but she's very busy sometimes. So call me if you have any questions on tenant in, um, occupied properties. We are going to move on unless anyone has any burning thoughts they have to say right now about that. Okay. Upcoming classes this week, there's no classes tomorrow. We do have six hours CE for the rest of the week, next week. So please make sure to get your CE and be on these classes. They're fantastic. Um, and well, congratulations to all the closers this last week. We had 57 closings. What a great week. Can't you tell it's like summer right now? It's busy, huh? All right, and then also um, we had the Hammies Homes and Chelsea Funk Real Estate team capped out this last week. So good job to them. Yay. Yay. Okay. All right. Let's go to our affiliates really quick. We have, um, is Jack Andrews on by any chance? Do not see him. Okay. How about Amy Corcoran at White Knight Insurance? Amy. You're on mute. There we go. Sorry, I didn't click hard enough. Um, yes, thank you. And just to reiterate um, what they said earlier, if you have a buyer that rents out their property, they absolutely have to have a landlord policy and their tenants have to have, or the people that are staying in the property, I don't care if it's 30, 60 days, they have to have a renter's policy to be adequately insured, correctly insured. If not, it's a big problem. Um, that policy does not cover their personal property. It doesn't cover the buyer. 
So it's a big, it's a big thing. They absolutely do need to have that. Even if it's only for 30 days, it, 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 that's the name of the game, right? Um, another thing is that I wanted to just touch on is understanding your policy and reading the fine print. Um, your insurance policy is actually a legal binding contract and you need to understand what is in there. Um, you wouldn't sign anything without knowing what's in your contract. Same with insurance policy. You wanna make sure you're looking at the insurance, the insuring agreement, the exclusions and the conditions. Those are all very important parts of the contract. If you don't, you have any questions, you're, even if it's not our policy, shoot it on over to me. I'll answer any questions you have, no problems. Um, I've done it many times before for Presidio agents, just so they understand what their buyer or even for yourself or friends or family are getting themselves into. Every carrier is different in their contract. They are not uniform. So it's always important to understand what you are signing. We're happy to help. Great advice. Thank you so much, Amy. All right. And then we have Patrick at Home Warranty America. Go right ahead, Patrick. Good morning, Jen. Thanks, everybody. Hey, I just wanted to congratulate 57 closings. That's going to wipe out inventory pretty fast, that many closings a week. <laughs> I had a B&I meeting this morning, and the realtor in my group said there were 20, uh, no, 38 homes currently listed in Utah County on the MLS. It's not a lot of inventory, so congrats on, on those kind of numbers. Just wanted to kind of remind everybody that Home Warranty of America is a preferred uh, home warranty company for Presidio Real Estate, and there's um, you know some great response, you know things that come with that. But we've got a phenomenal promo that's still running through the end of June. The you know our Arlo camera, this thing is is amazing, guys. Um, it's a hundred and thirty dollar camera from Arlo, and it's absolutely free with every buyer home warranty. So when you're talking about adding value to the services you do, that's a great value. Plus, Jen recommends it. So how can you go wrong there, right, Jen? So um, we've got three products, add-on items for customizable features. We can pretty much meet all your budget items. Our top-of-the-line warranty is 525. That's usually well within the means of uh, uh, writing it up in a, into a contract and giving your homeowners, your buyers, your clients really good coverage. So uh, I'm my phone's always on, and I'm able to take your calls, put those orders on, at midnight when you're when you forget to do them for the next morning just call me thanks guys i really appreciate your service thanks for that you're awesome thanks pat yeah, yeah in this market it seems like you know a lot of us are as as representing buyers are not asking for home warranties because we are pretty sure the sellers aren't going to pay for it um if you are a very giving agent you can pay for that home warranty and you can tell them by the way i just bought you a arlo camera is it arlo arlo a-r-l-o a-r-l-o yeah which is is for your closing gift as well as a home warranty that'll last you a whole whole year. And you look like the hero. So don't forget to order a home warranty from Home Warranty of America with Patrick. He's amazing. Thanks, All right, yeah. I, I don't see anybody on from Lunetta Home Loan. So we are going to move on to our educator for the day, which is Wendy Morris talking about hidden icebergs. Wendy, we were so glad to have you take the, over the show, okay? <laughs> All right, thanks. Let me share my screen really quickly. Here we go. Okay, well, thank you for having me today. Um, like, like she said, I, um, my name is Wendy Morris. I am a certified Optavia Health Coach um, in partnership with the Center of Obesity Prevention Education from Vill Villanova University. And um, I'm excited to talk to you guys today about something that I am super passionate about. Um, I coach with a company, like I've mentioned, called Optavia. Opta meaning op your optimal, um, via meaning life. And that is why I fell in love with this company. This is a company that believes in getting rid of the yo-yo diets and teaching people how to create habits to create their optimal life. Um, and, and as much as I love talking about um, eating and nutrition and that kind of stuff, we're actually not going to talk about that today. I'm not going to tell you about um, the things that you should or shouldn't be eating, um, but I do want to just give a little bit of a reference um, for this company as it kind of um, leads into the things I'm going to talk about today. So Optavia has what is called a trilogy of health, or as my cute little Catholic friend calls it, the holy trinity of health. I'll take it, whatever it is. Um, this includes all three areas to create a holistic health, healthy body. Obviously we know that, right? We know we need a healthy body to do the things that we need to do, the things that we want to be doing in this life. 
um, a healthy mind, helps our, our capabilities to dream, to detach from our limiting, limiting beliefs, to start really acting. Um, and, and as we know, our body only does what our mind tells us as a two. So healthy mind is such a huge component and a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and then at the final part of the trilogy, which kind of confuses some people sometimes, um, is healthy finances, uh, which is a really powerful place to be in. When you have the ability, the, the resources to pursue the dreams that you want, um, you end up giving back in very ab abundant ways. So healthy body, healthy mind, and healthy finances is what we call the trilogy of health. And, um, and through these, you can start seeing patterns and developing patterns and getting rid of patterns that don't serve you anymore um, to create what you intended to create in this life. So I want to share with you a little bit about my background, um, where I came from um, and what started me into knowing I needed to change. In my um, early to mid twenties, I discovered running. So it's great as much as I loved the friends that I was running with and the people that I was um, learning to, um, to learn from, I realized that I started running out of fear that the one thing that I could control would somehow make up for the things that I couldn't. And those things were my addiction to sugar. And I know we joke about that all the time. Uh, yeah, I have an addiction to sugar. We, we, we pass that around like it's no big deal, but this was a real, real thing for me. I knew it and it started when I was very, very young. Um, I love my parents dearly, but back when I was being raised in the 80s, they did not have the tools to help children process emotions. Um, I don't blame them for that. It's just something that we didn't do. My dad was a very um, big emotional eater, and, and that is how he taught us to deal with anything emotional. Um, and I'm not just talking about the negative things. So um, a lot of our positive things were always celebrated around food. If we won sporting events, if we did well in school, every time that was rewarded with food. And, and as, a, as a kid, I kind of liked that, you know? And um, I remember even being my dad's chocolate girl, like him and I were the ones in our family that, um, that liked chocolate. And so I identified that, that I grew to, to, to love that about myself, that I loved sugar and I loved chocolate. And this connected me to my dad. Well, unfortunately, as you know, um, there's not just negative things or positive things that happen in our lives. As I started growing and experiencing very negative emotions, very hard emotions, um, hurt, pain, betrayal, um, those things I didn't know how to deal with. I didn't know what to do with. And so I figured if, hey, if food worked with those positive emotions, then certainly they would help with the negative ones as well. And so um, I went to sugar, right? A lot of us do. Um, for me, it got worse and worse as I was able to provide that sugar for myself. Um, throughout high school, early college, um, I could eat an entire brown, pound of brownies. Like it was just my comfort food. Matter of fact, when I first got married, the early years of my marriage, the marriage has a way of bringing out all of the things that you don't want people to see. It's, it's interesting when someone enters into your personal space and you realize you can't hide some of the stuff that you've been hiding all your life. I remember one time my husband and I had, had made an, an entire batch of cookies and we put it in this little cookie jar we had on our county counter. And he went to work the next day and I sat for two solid hours and ate every single cookie in there because I was struggling, feeling worthy in that marriage relationship and, and knowing what to do. And um, I felt so embarrassed by that, that I spent the rest of the afternoon making a whole other batch of cookies and filling up that cookie jar so that when he came home, he didn't realize what a gross slob that he had married um, and how emotionally despondent I was. I just didn't know how to handle it. And so I went to sugar um, and then discovered that running um, in my own head could balance that, right? In my head, I thought, well, I have this addiction that I don't know what to do with and that I emotionally can't, can't solve. So maybe I can just run it off. Maybe I can balance that out. Um, but I knew deep side and down, down inside of me, I, that that wasn't going to work, right? I knew that I was lying to myself and that this was something that was out of control and out of balance. So a couple of years ago, um, I had um, a coach reach out to me and, um, and I knew I wanted to change. Now, at first I said, yeah, I have about 10 pounds to lose. Let's try this program. Let's see if we can have it. But really deep down inside, I knew I needed to get a hold and change these habits, change the habits that, were, that I was emotionally going to food to fill, to buffer from that. And so I did. I discovered what I needed to change. And I want you to think for just a second about what it is in your life. What is your pain point? What do you want changed? 
What do you want in life? And how do you arrive at that change? I'm going to read a quote. And while I read this, I want you to be thinking about what you want. What is it that you want in life? Each of us has two distinct choices to make about what we will do with our lives. The first choice we can make is to be less than we have the capacity to be, to earn less, to have less, to read less, to think less, to try less and discipline ourselves less. These are the choices that lead to an empty life. The choices that once made lead to a life of constant worry instead of, lives of, of, of a, instead of a life of wondrous anticipation. Okay, and the second choice, to do it all to become all that we can possibly be, to read every book that we possibly can, to earn as much as we possibly can, to give and share as much as we possibly can, to strive and produce and accomplish as much as we possibly can. All of us have a choice to do or to not to do, to be or to not to be, to be all or to be less or to be nothing at all. Like a tree, it would be worthy challenge for us all to stretch upward and outward to the full measure of our capabilities. Why not do all that you can every moment you can, the best you can for as long as you can? And that was by Jim Rohn, whom I love. Um, so I wanna just really get clear on what you want. What is it that you want in this life? Now I want you to write it down, say it out loud. You're on mute, I can't hear you, that's fine. Um, but what is it that you want? And I want you to be very, very careful here and not, and be aware of the wants that you think that you should want. <laughs> is, is it a societal pressure want? Is it something that your boss thinks that you should want? Is it something that, um, that culture thinks that you should want? I want it to be what, what you want. Okay, once we've done that, I want to ask you just one other question. Is this what you really want? Is it what you really, really want? Like if you were in a room full of no one else besides yourself and you could dream just a little bit, is this what you really, really want? Um, this happens with all my clients um, very often. It's, it's very interesting. Um, it's not the food or the program or any of those things that um, is hardest for them. What's hardest for them is, is figuring out what they want. Because as adults, we don't know how to dream. We have been told and we have evidence in our lives that this is, this is what you can do. This is what, um, this is what you're capable of, or these are the parameters, like keep your wants within this parameters because we don't want to be disappointed, right? We don't want to be upset um, by not achieving those goals. But what I think is a fascinating thing is um, the purpose of wanting things is not actually to get to that want. Now bear with me for a second. The purpose of being and stating out loud the things that we want is everything that happens in between. It's everything that happens in between declaring that want and obtaining that want. It's that process in between where we are learning, we are becoming, and we are growing. So by the time we get there, we have uh, become something completely different. And, and, and there, it doesn't serve us to think that, oh, we just have to be content with where we are or, or it's not being grateful. Matter of fact, one of the biggest um, elements of gratitude is in wanting to always be increasing in, and progressing. Show gratitude for the life, show it to your higher power, show it to God, whatever you resonate with, but always have something that you want that will stretch you, that you can build that in-between space. Now, um, the um, Dr. Wayne Scott Anderson um, was the creator of Optavia. He's the 10th board certified critical care physician in the United States, and he dealt with 30 years of dealing with disease. And um, he decided one day, I want to stop treating disease. I want to swim upstream and start preventing disease. And so he went to, um, to creating this, this business, this uh, Optavia, to creating healthy, the, um, an optimal health life for people. And he said in a recent training that I was listening to, one of the most dangerous words in the English language is fine. I'm fine right? How often do we say that? I'm fine. Like, yes, I don't have the things that I thought I would have when I was 40, 50, whatever, but I'm fine. I'm fine. Like life is fine. Um, I want you to question if your life is fine and are you okay with the word fine? Now I understand we can't control everything. Um, there are a lot of things outside of our control that happened to us. Um, COVID, um, situations that, you know, happened to our kids, our family members, um, but what if you had the tools to see the world as so much more than fine? Today, I want to do a little bit of that. I want to share some of these tools with you to open up what you can possibly dream for. Um, 
So what do you want? What are you afraid of want? Let me ask you a question. If you are struggling with this question about what you want, if this is a hard thing to even attack, to address, um, or if your desire or what you want feels kind of shallow, I wanna just give you a couple of, um, of talking points and to address, to understand how to elicit a more strong why. Um, because life happens and things get hard, right? And I tell this to my clients all the time, you know, those days that you have that you want, you just to eat all of the things, you are gonna need a strong why. So I really, really want to connect what you want with emotional response. Now, I'm not saying you have to sit and cry about it, right? Like we don't have to, I don't have to elicit that like tearful response. But we can do this by asking yourself why. They, there's something in psychology that's called the five whys um, to get to the root of an issue. Um, this is a powerful tool to use with the things that you want in your life. Um, let me give you an example. So a lot of people come to me and they say, well, I want to lose weight. And I ask them, why? What, do you, what would you do? How would you live your life? And, and maybe some of them say, well, you know, I, you know, I want to I want to lose weight so I can fit into clothes. Well, what kind of clothes? Well, you know, I, I actually really want to feel attractive to my spouse. Okay, what's going on there? Well, I feel like I've lost myself in the last 20 years. Um, and we start getting deeper and deeper and we realize, oh, there's a self-worth issue um, that maybe needs to be addressed. Um, asking deeper questions can lead um, to an emotional response to help people really discover why they are doing this. Now, like I said, it doesn't have to be a negative response. Um, a lot of people are, are excited. They can they gain their motivation from wanting to do something in the future. So in other words, um, maybe maybe they want to they come to me and they say, I want to lose weight. And I say, why? And they're like, you know what? I can see myself in 10 years climbing this mountain with my son and I want to teach him the importance of being out in nature and how that can rejuvenate and, and live in and I ask him why why what what's so important about that and he can and he tells me that you know he and his dad went out on the mountains and this is where he really connected to his son and um and and you see how you can get to a point where by just asking deeper questions that attaches an emotional response and sometimes it's a motivating response like sometimes it's it's not just a painful place that they're coming from but um but a very um excited place that they want to get to so does your why elicit a strong emotional response. Um, let's, let's go on and I wanna share with you um, one that was for me. So when I started my program and my journey with health, I knew one of the reasons I wanted to get healthy was to be at, in the swimming pool mom. Now, let me explain what I mean to this. I grew up with an amazing mother who when, took us swimming often, okay? But what I noticed really early on is she was always in the pool with us, always. The other moms were in their little cover-ups and they were reading their books and they got all mad if they got splashed. And my mom was in the pool and she loved to be in the pool with us and we were playing. And I remember thinking what made her like, want, like, put away her insecurities and jump in the water with us. And, and when I started having kids, I knew that this was something I wanted. I wanted to be an in the swimming pool type of mom. Well, initially when I wanted to start my health journey, I thought I needed to look a certain way. I needed to be like thin and tan and all the things in order to be, have the confidence in order to get into the pool with my mom. Um, and I, and that was my initial why, but luckily I had a coach, um, that asked me questions that got me looking at my why and looking at what I wanted. And what we discovered through those questions is I didn't necessarily need or want to get to a certain weight or get to a certain look. I wanted the confidence. I wanted the self-satisfaction that I could be in a room and love who I was with <laughs> um, and, and love that I was with myself and be with myself and my thoughts. I wanted to be the kind of person that was so much more concerned about connecting with my kids than what other people thought about me at the pool. And because I had that, I had now a better, more emotional want. I had a desire to go after that person. And guess what? My health journey wasn't so much about losing weight as it was fixing my mind, fixing the way I saw food, fixing, changing my habits around food, changing my habits around the way I thought about myself, how much I cared about what other people thought. This was pivotal in switching the way I looked at health. And I, and I just, I still love that to this day. So you are here for either personal development, um, maybe professional development, 
what is it in your life? Wait. And now here's the second question I want you to ask. Now this question is my favorite question because we all can get to a point where we know what we want, but what are you going to do to keep from getting it? Don't you love that? Because we all do stuff, right? We all are in our own way sometimes. What are you going to do to keep from getting it? Um, I want you to think about this question for a second as we review a little bit of history. So as you know, um, in, on April in 1912, Titanic was a British passenger liner operated that sank in the North Atlantic Ocean on, on um, April 15th, 1912, um, after striking an iceberg during her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York City. This is such a great parable for our lives. What they didn't know was what caused their destruction. I want to relate that to what you have just talked about, the things that you want in your life. Because I want you to look at this iceberg and the tip of the iceberg, the things that are above the surface, these are our conscious desires. These are our words. These are the things that, that we can both say and we can share with people and they probably know about us. These are the things that everyone could see by, by looking at what happens, right? And the words that we say. But underneath here, underneath, sometimes bigger than the things that we say are our unconscious commitments or other way, in other words, they are the results of our lives. And how often do we say that we want this and we keep running into icebergs and we can't get about out of our own way? Let me give you an example. So I have a lot of people come to me, like I mentioned, saying, I wanna lose weight. And I, and which is awesome, but they are unconsciously committed to snacking every late afternoon and evening. They say, no, 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 I'm committed. I, I am, I, this is my conscious desire is to stay on plan hundred percent, but they are unconsciously committed to the idea that refusing food from people is rude, right? So every time at work, at home, at neighbors, at parties, when they are offered food, they accept and they get thrown them off plan. Um, let's try it. Let's try another one. Uh, let's, let's steer away from food a little bit. Let's say that, um, we want a great relationship or we say that we want a better relationship with our spouse or even our friends or our children. Um, and, but we are unconsciously committed to always being right, to proving our point. Um, ironically, this one characteristic will block us to all sorts of mentorship, help, guidance, correction. Being right is simply a perception. This is an interesting concept that I teach a lot of people. Um, we come to this world and through our experiences, we develop rules on our planet. And what's interesting about these rules is they are our own rules and everyone has their own rules on their own planets. And what happens when those rules contradict each other? Okay, I, I use the kids with uh, an example with kids all the time. So I might have a rule on my planet that when I ask my kids to do something, I expect it to be done right away. And they say, sure, mom, and I'm, they'll go do it. That's a rule on my planet, right? But my kid might have a rule on their planet that when they hear their mom ask them to do something, they'll think about it. And then they'll finish the game that they're playing. And then they'll think about it again. And then maybe they'll do it, right? So do you see how their rule on their planet and my rule on my planet often conflict? Well, what if I was so stuck to being right? What if my right had to come first in everything, right? Do you think that that unconscious commitment to being right would affect my want, my desire to increase a better relationship with my, with my spouse or my child? Um, yeah, it would, but there's an alternative to it, right? We can let go of a little control, let go of a little bit of needing to be right and see, okay, I have rules on my planet. What if I didn't drop them? What if I just loosened them a little bit and said, okay, if you'll communicate to, with me that you want to finish your game before we, before you do what I've asked you, then, then I'd be willing to let you finish your game. And we have that communication. And then by addressing those unconscious commitments, do you see how I can then increase that relationship and get what I want? Now, I know that's a little bit um, of a, a really easy example, but I want you to think about the things that you are wanting to be right, or you just feel that you were right, right? I mean, there's a whole skew of them, religion, politics, whatever, you just know that you're just right and you're holding them like this stress ball, right? Um, I'm just offering you suggestion to loosen your grip 
holding tight to something like that, to being right, often causes fatigue. And I'm not just talking about muscle fatigue and, and, and arm strength fatigue. I'm talking about fatigue in our relationships, fatigue in getting the things that you want. So I'm not asking you to drop what's important to you. I'm not asking you to, to say there's no rules, like do whatever you want. I'm just asking you to loosen your grip on those things that you are want or that you think are right. And perhaps you are going to be able to see that there are other perspectives that just might aid in yours and help you get to your desires, get to what you want. So back to our conscious desires um, and our unconscious commitments. Let's give you, let's do one more example. Let's say you're consciously desiring to be or to have a $1 million business, maybe a multi-million dollar business, right? But because you are um, con unconsciously committed to the story you developed as a child, that money is hard or it's scarce or there's not enough of it or that it might run out, um, you keep hitting these icebergs. Um, what if you want you, what if you say out loud that you want your business to grow, but you are committed to people pleasing and staying in your comfort level? Do you see how these things that you are unconsciously committed to are preventing you from getting your conscious desires, the things that you are saying out loud, writing on your vision board, um, speaking out to the world, these declarations that you want. Um, I wanna share just one of mine. So I, um, when I first started coaching, I knew I wanted to share the gift of health with people. It had, especially the mind work behind it, it had completely changed how I thought about food. I told you a little bit about that story. Um, I didn't I didn't give up exercise, but I realized that exercise could be something to, to um, increase the joy in my life and not be a punishment and not be something I had to do from fear of what my sugar addiction would cause. I wanted to share the gift with 100 people every year. I wanted to show people how living your best life involves mastering your habits and being a good steward over your body and your emotions and processing them and allowing them both the good and the bad. I wanted to not be emotionally throwing up all over people, right? Or, I, or taking on other people's emotional throw up. Um, I wanted this for people. I wanted them to see the impact their physical health could have on their emotional health their mental health, their spiritual health. I wanted to share it. But luckily for me, <laughs> I had a wise coach that showed me what my unconscious commitments were. I was unconsciously committed to controlling what other people think about me, to people pleasing, to making sure everyone liked me along this whole journey, and to staying in my comfort zone. And do you think those things were preventing me from sharing this gift with 100 people a year? Yeah, you bet. You bet it was. Um, matter of fact, I found that I found that in social groups, um, there was a lot of pushback. When I started shifting and improving my health, a lot of people around me um, started resisting that. And I find that that's a pattern with people. Um, it's not comfortable for those around us to start shifting up, right? Because you have a you have a choice. If someone around you is increasing um, their their awareness of life or increasing their health or their habits, you have a choice to either shift up with them. Or to stay where you are and it's uncomfortable to stay where we are so we often give those people pushback right well i experienced that i remember going to a a, a social situation with a lot of my friends and they're like uh you're not eating sugar again and as if i wore this shirt that just said party killer on it right and i was and i was taken back by that and i didn't like it and i didn't you know i wanted my friends to still like think that i could go to these social situations and and, and have fun and and i didn't like that they were you know um being critical of these good changes that I was making to my life. But what I realized then that I had to let that all go. I had to be aware that these unconscious commitments to, to making people like me or, or, or caring what other people thought of me was preventing me from speaking out loud about this gift that had changed my life. And so I started attacking and addressing those unconscious commitments one by one. And slowly but surely, I started developing tools to, that when I was triggered by people's things on social media or in, in social situations, I could let them go. I could remind myself, no, 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 that's an unconscious commitment. And I am now making a conscious commitment to what I really want. Um, so let me ask you a question. Wouldn't it be cool if you could figure out what you were unconsciously committed to? These hidden icebergs that are preventing you from getting what you actually want.
Well, today I hope to do that and just in part, I want to share just a couple of tools um, and, and give you those so that you can start melting your icebergs. First of all, we find um, some of those icebergs by just being aware of them. I need you to look at the results of your life. What are you committed to? How is this pattern familiar? How is the pattern serving you? And most importantly, how can I take 100% responsibility for the pattern and then correct it? You know, um, I think it's interesting that um, when something's not going right, when we're not getting the goals that we are achieving, we're not hitting those benchmarks, we're not we're attaining those things that we set out that we're saying, I want this. Um, I want you to stop looking around. It's not your broker's fault. It's not your client's fault. It's not the market's fault or how many people see your listings or your social media's fault uh, or your social media posts. It is your own unconscious commitments to mindsets and circumstances that are not serving you anymore. Bust through these mindsets, bust through these unconscious commitments, and these things that you want, these desires will flow into your life because the circumstances don't matter, which means that sometimes it is you that's in your own way. Truly, we are our biggest obstacle. But here's something fascinating. In Optavia, we have a saying that the, that, um, the obstacle is the way. So if you are the obstacle and the obstacle is the way, and you are also the way to getting what you want. Don't you love that? You have the power. If you're your biggest obstacle, then you it's, it's all about you and you taking the time to address and understand these unconscious um, commitments it's, is, is the way that's gonna help you get what you want. And so I love that. So I wanna teach you this tool. Um, this has by far been the best tool for me to start understanding my unconscious commitments, to understand and, and take a whole different perspective of the, of the world and, um, and start really melting the icebergs that I have in my own life. And I do that through something called the line. I know it's such an elaborate word for a model. Um, this is a binary model created um, by a woman named Diana Chapman and Jim Detner, um, who have a book called The 15 um, Commitments of Conscious Leadership, which I totally recommend. If you want your team or your, you're a manager of any kind to um, learn these conscious commitments, um, read and study this book together. 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. It's so powerful. Um, and I, um, the line is very, very important. Um, to understanding where you are. This is the most important question we know all in real estate. This is who I'm talking to, right? These three words, location, location, location. As we talk about the line today, I want you to identify where you are at. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about above the line and below the line. And the goal, the purpose is just to, for right now, figure out where, where you're at. Are you below? Are you above? And I'm going to talk about what, what it means to be above the, and below the line so you can kind of identify a little bit more. So above the line thinking is simply looking at the world that the world is happening by me. Okay. Nothing is happening to you, but everything is happening by me. These are some of the beliefs that you might hear yourself. Can you hear yourself say these things? Um, it's more valuable to learn and grow than to be right. There are always more than two possibilities, right? We never box ourselves in. Um, appro approval, control, and security are something I already have. I don't seek that from other people. I don't need that from other things. Um, it's valuable to question my thoughts. I'm okay questioning my stance on things. Um, nothing is serious. I don't take things too serious, right? right? People and circumstances are my allies, even when they seem negative, okay? This is important. Um, I do things that help me shift. I breathe. Okay. I get curious. I'm listening more consciously. I allow myself to feel emotions. Um, I appreciate, I take responsibility for everything that happens. I question my beliefs. I'm okay with questioning my beliefs because it leads to truth, right? Um, I'm okay playing, right? How many of adults are, are comfortable in a play zone? How many of us? I'll be honest, that's a hard one for me. It's hard for me to sit and play. Um, I'm, I'm often too serious in life. And so I, I have to remind myself and shift up above that line. This is things that you'll hear yourself. What can I learn from this? How is this familiar? How, what do I, what can I take responsibility for? I choose to, I create, right? Above the line is all about creating the life. Nothing, nothing is forcing you. Nothing is, is causing you to be a victim of this, of this world, right? Um, those are the type of statements that you 
are comfortable with saying if you're above the line. Now let's switch, let's switch to the below the line because if you're like me, you often spend a lot of time below the line. So this is, this is a, a mindset that everything is happening to me. There are things out of my control, right? Beliefs, being right is the most important thing. Um, there's a threat out there. There's something is, and I have to defend myself, right? I have to protect myself. Um, you're needing other people's approval. Um, there's not enough. I have to hoard what I have right now because it might not be enough tomorrow. There might not be stuff tomorrow. Um, I need to be in control. Control is, is key to below the line thinking. Um, everything is serious. There's only two options and I'm in, stuck in between a rock and a hard place. Like that sums up below the line, rock and a hard place. Um, there is absolutely a right and there's absolutely a wrong. Um, there is no choice. It's just one or the other. Um, they cling to opinions. They find blame. They, they, they point out blame. They argue, you're rationalizing, you're gossiping, you're overwhelmed often. How many of us are like, oh shoot, I'm, I'm there. Um, statements that you can you hear yourself making is, oh, I really should do this. I, should, I can't right now. It's, this is hard. I'm trying, I'm trying sounds positive, right? But I'm trying is coming from a place of lack. I'm trying is, is saying that there is something that you don't already have. Um, confusion. Um, placing blame, you made me, I'm sorry, never. Um, you're not listening to me, it's no use throwing the towel. Okay, these are the kind of things, life is happening to me and I don't know how to get out of it. This is below the line thinking. Now, where are you at? Where are you at with your children? Where are you at with your spouse? Where are you at in your business, with the, your coworkers, with your clients? Do you find yourself more above the line? even when your clients are irrational and, and just crazy, where do you find yourself? Are you blaming them? Are there circumstances that are just too much that this is just making life the way it is? Okay, location, 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 you guys know this. Um, where are you? This is something I discovered um, kind of late in the game. <laughs> um, it's a normal state to be below the line. Okay, um, let me share an experience with you. I once, um, called my coach in Optavia. Everyone has a coach, which is a huge family. Everyone, you get support. I have a coach. My coach has a coach. It's just had the way um, that we show accountability. Um, and I love it. Um, so I called my coach one day because I knew this model and I knew I was living below the line in every area of my life. My business wasn't growing because no one felt like help was important to them. And my house was always a mess because my kids didn't want to stand up and help me and take the time to like put away their own clothes. Um, my husband was out of town here and there and, you know, and he wasn't stepping up. My clients were struggling and, and, and so I was bending over backwards to make sure that they were happy and, and all these things. Okay. So I called my coach and I said, I was like, I know I'm below the line. I just cannot figure out how to get above the line. I don't know how to step into creatorship. I'm blocked to how to improve and how to grow my business and how to take care of home life and all the things. And and I was shocked by her response because she told me, why are you in such a hurry to get above the line? And I said, well, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't below the line bad and above the line good? And she, what she showed me was my resisting was actually keeping me below the line. And that sometimes we need to gain wisdom below the line. And so she encouraged me to play below the line to play in what's called the drama triangle. And she showed this, this um, model that has to do with the line that I want to share with you because there's power in this type of awareness in our lives. As you can see here, there are two different types of triangles. There is the empowerment triangle that lives above the line and the trauma triangle, which lives below the line. And both are cycles. Both are cycles that we find are hard to get out of. So um, I wanna talk just a little bit about this below the line drama triangle. Now this is fascinating to me because I find if we can find ourselves in this triangle, then the awareness alone gives us permission to shift out of it. So will you play with me for just a second, okay? So we have the victim. Okay, most of us are very comfortable in the victimhood. We know when it's just, life's not fair. Why are all these people making this X amount of money and I am stuck and I'm struggling and this is, this. life is happening to me. This is being done to me. Um, the villain, if we are the victim, then certainly there's a villain out there, right? Um, it could be other people. It could be your boss. Like this is, it could be, um, 
the economy, right? The economy is the villain. It's just, I, you know, I can't grow my business. I can't do these things that I want because the, of the economy or because of coronavirus. And actually coronavirus is a fascinating um, experience to plug into the drama triangle. It's actually really, really, really um, powerful to see how people dealing with both the virus itself and masks and homeschooling and all of things fit into this. How many people felt like a victim to the people that weren't wearing masks back then or a victim to this virus. That there's nothing that they could do and that they had to stay at home and all the things and, and maybe they villainized the virus. Maybe they villainized the government. Maybe they villainized all those people that just refused to get vaccinated or refused to wear the mask. Do you see how we, we stayed in that victim? A lot of us um, stayed in that victimhood and had decided who our villains were or maybe we became the villain. Maybe we're like, no, I, I'm, I'm the villain in this story. And you blamed yourself or you wanted to find fault with who was at fault. You know, you were looking for who can I blame for this? You know, what government didn't move fast enough? What, what school system did not have the preparations that they needed? We can find ourselves in the situation. And then the last one is a hero stage. Now this is interesting because, and coronavirus again is a very good example of this. A lot of times as we move from victim to villain, we also then shift to heroing where you step in thinking, I need to save the day, right? Maybe you're sick of being a victim and, and, you, and, you, and you no longer want to see yourself as a villain. So you have something to fight for. You have to, some, a point to prove, right? And you start enabling victims, giving them permission to be victims. I, I, I saw this and with no judgment because I found myself doing it too, but I, I saw this with how we dealt with our children in um, during the virus, right? We had teenagers and, and seniors that were not having the graduation that they deserved. They, they were not getting all of, um, all of the benefits of just living that last senior year. And so what did we do? We came in, we're saving the day because we were so uncomfortable with our children being uncomfortable, right? Which is very ironic because usually um, in our uncomfortableness, uh, a part of our brain is activated where we go into creatorship mode and we can actually create and solve so many problems until someone comes in trying to save the day, right? And most of these kids were good and they were fine, but I, I found it interesting and fascinating, mostly from a curious point of view, not a really judgmental point of view, but how quickly us as parents wanted to go in and save the day and hero them and just be like, oh, it's okay, we'll make up for this. We'll do all these elaborate things, you know? And, and I thought that was interesting to see how sometimes heroing, which often turns into enabling them, keeps those kids out of creating about thinking and solving their own problems. So I thought that was kind of a fascinating realization. So, and, I, and that's where I was, right? I was right in the middle of this. So let's, let's talk about the opposite. Let's go on to the empowerment triangle because this is where it's fun because down there, it almost seems like, well, yeah, there's nothing we can do about it, right? But what's fascinating about just the awareness of alone, and we're gonna talk a little bit how to shift up into this is, um, is talking about the empowerment triangle. Now look how different this is. Instead of being a victim, as a creator, you are creating your new story. You are in charge of what happens. Life is not happening to you. Life is happening by you. You create. When bad things happen, when hard things happen, like Corona or whatever, you go to work and figuring out, okay, I can't go out. I can't go to the store. What can I do? You stay in the genius of your creatorship, right? And then you learn and look outside of yourself. Who can I help? Not who's the villain, but who can I reach out to? How can I help others see that they are not a victim, that they too are creators? How can I get there? How can I coach others to join in this effort with me? You empower others to be successful, okay? You're a challenger. You challenge your, your beliefs. You challenge that coronavirus was negative at all. Now, I understand. I understand that there were, there were deaths that involved and there were hard things about coronavirus. I get it. But to challenge that some, there's a silver lining in it. The obstacles, the obstacles, the way the obstacles help me get better. And when I'm open and curious at those things, then I can stay in this creatorship, this empowerment triangle. Um, I, I, I want to read a quote real quick by Jim Detner. So he's the one that has created this, um, this above and below the line. 
But what's important about when you locate yourself above or below the line is what we call shift moves. How to shift from below the line up to the above the line, how to decrease and, and often at times how we drift. We all fall off the consciousness wagon, he says. We're above the line and the next thing you know, we're not. We've drifted below the line, we've become reactive and fear is running the show. Once we wake up and realize self-awareness is always the first key to conscious leadership, we're below the line and option is to shift. My experience is that practice shifters have their favorite go-to shift moves. Breathe, move, play in the drama triangle, question their story, appreciate and speak unarguably. Okay, so we don't have very much time left, but let's talk a couple of shift moves. Like when you find yourself and you know that you're in the drama triangle, you're, you're, you realize that your outlook on life is very victim-based, is you're, you're, you're casting villains and you're heroing to save the day and you feel like you have to save people from their discomfort. I want you to find your own shift moves, okay? Examine your limiting beliefs. There are things that are just not true that you are believing, okay? Change the way you think, the way you're talking to yourself, even just a changing your posture, smiling, taking a deep breath, taking a step back, shifting up into that mood is a very, very powerful place to be. Move your body, okay? Exercise can be a, a huge tool to shift from that drama triangle up into that empowerment triangle. Um, create empowering rituals. Some of you have this early morning rituals, um, declarations, I am statements, things like that are very, very helpful. Now, um, a lot of this, um, is a process, right? This is something that we learn slowly. But I encourage you, if you have found yourself below the line, thinking that life is happening to you, that your business is not growing because of all these other circumstances, go inward. Look at your own subconscious um, commitments to yourself. Discover them, be aware of them, and then choose to shift up back into creatorship. Um, as a review, I just want to go over just a couple of things that we mentioned, and then I promise in the next 60 seconds, I'll let you go. Um, we talked a lot about change, right? Why we want to change, what you really, really want, what you are doing to keep from getting what you want, being aware of that question, right? Our hidden icebergs, our unconscious commitments that are giving us conflicting results. We talked about living above in the low line, cycling in that drama triangle, and shift moves to get us above the line to, in the empowerment triangle. Um, we, we talked about the obstacle is the way and that you are the obstacle. So that means that you are also the way. Um, look to yourself to gain that momentum. Do the work to uncover your icebergs and shift above the line. And I promise you those things that you wanted at the beginning of this will flow into your life. It's a fascinating process to watch. It's super empowering. Um, if health is something that you know is something that you want, but you keep hitting those icebergs, please reach out to me. Um, I, I, I put my own phone number there. I don't have a website that you, that you go to because I am a one-on-one -on -one coach. Um, I feel like it's, it's important to know what you want and see if I'm a good fit for you. Um, I, we talk a lot about the mental work doing what I do. Yes. We put you on a program. Yes. We encourage you, um, to check in, to do the mind work, to, to eat, um, a certain way to help you live your best life. But I want to talk to you first. I'm going to get on the call with you. I'm going to talk to you face to face. If this is something that you want, um, reach out to me, email me, text me, call me, whatever. Um, I would love to help you discover what you're unconsciously committed to. Um, and if it has to do with health, mental health, your financial health, um, your physical health, please um, reach out. I'd love to share. And that's all I have for you today. Thanks for letting me um, stop by here. Wendy, thank you very much. This is uh, some things that I've been thinking about. And um, I think um, I woke up this morning thinking, okay, I'm way below the line, as you put it. So uh, you gave me some things to kind of think about um, to kind of get me back as to where I need to be. So awesome. thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wendy, you're amazing, as always. Truly inspiring. Thank you for coming to do this for us. And uh, hopefully people will contact you so that they can better themselves and their lives and their businesses. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks. See ya.
gracias.